to the Beards and the Bible podcast. Everybody on this podcast typically has a beard, but not tonight. <laughs> there's, there's kind of a beard going on. So, Gabe, who are you joined by tonight, sir? Um, my fair lady, my bride, Stacy. Mm. Hi, Stacy. Hey, Josh. I'm, I'm usually listening to you guys laughing like a crazy person with my earbuds in, so now I won't be listening to this episode because I don't want to hear my voice, <laughs> but I'll have already heard it, I guess. Yeah. This is uh, my wife, Jenny. You guys have met. Yes. Hi. I, yeah. I miss our, uh, our hangouts in your living room or the last time we hung out in your living room was so fun yeah we we talked um it's always fun to talk like personality stuff with you guys because it always intrigues me like whenever we talk about the fact that josh you're like an introvert and you're one of those secret introverts that's super (laughs) uh super super social and then you just shut down and you're like i gotta i gotta go home gotta recharge absolutely Absolutely. And Jenny yeah, is I'm actually kind of, the uh, extrovert in your relationship. I am. It's kind of the surprise. Everybody thinks that it's Josh, mm-hmm. and in fact, it's not. He's like, okay, enough socializing. I would like to go back home. And I'm like, but there's people. We must talk. We must hang out. But yeah, it's kind of it's kind of funny. I feel like over the years I've slowly like become a little bit mm-hmm. more comfortable being alone. And maybe he's become a little bit more comfortable being around people. I don't know about that. I still, <laughs> I still can turn grumpy. This old is man. your limit right here, with the four of us. Yeah, this is this is good. Four four people hanging out is good. Any more than that? Mm-hmm. No, I'm just kidding. Gabe, you doing okay, man? You you you're kind of battling a little bit of a bug, just like I am. Yeah, I've got a cold, so. You know, oh, man. you'll see me go off frame for a second and blow all the snot out of my nostrils into a <laughs> piece of paper or toilet paper. Yeah. And I'll come back as if nothing happened. So, yeah, I'm mm. um, in the throes of a cold and uh, just, you know, the wonderful experience that that is. So, yeah, yeah. other than that, I'm great. That's real dedication to the podcast that you would log on. And you would spend an hour of your life or however long this podcast ends up being for the sake of our listeners. So I salute you, sir. Yeah. Yeah. It's either that or I just didn't have any other free nights in the week, but I'll let you guys. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. I, yeah. I don't mind doing it. As long as you don't mind me sounding like I'm, I've got, I don't know, 10 PSI worth of snot in my, <laughs> in my, <laughs> And no, I actually think it sounds like sinus, sinus, sinus cavity. Yeah. Yeah. It actually, I think it makes a good voice for radio. Help, help okay. Gabe out with his, his anatomy terminology. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Stacy and Jenny, why don't you guys introduce mm-hmm. yourselves? Cause people listen to Gabe and I all the time. We know you guys, but our listeners don't. So which one of you guys wants to introduce yourself and tell how long you've been married to us weirdos. And uh, what was it about your husband that you first noticed and thought, I want to marry this dude? So who wants to go first? I guess I'll dive in. I am uh, was not prepared for that question, but Gabe and I have been <laughs> married 15 years. Jenny, this is your time to think, get, get your answer together. So we've been married 15 years. Um, I wish I could say it was like some wonderful character trait that I first noticed in Gabe, but I saw him playing in a band in front of Spence Hall at Southeastern University. And I Mm. thought he is super cute, which is (laughs) definitely not a great way to choose a spouse. But uh, in this instance, there was um, there was more to him than than just being a, a cute uh, were you drumming or were you on the guitar? I don't, I don't know. I don't know. I don't so that's, He's playing the that's how we met. And that's, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, spoon. so yeah, I, <laughs> um, I, 
homeschool our three boys and um, take in herds of cats when they, you know, when they get dropped in my neighborhood. And that's what I do with my free time is clean cat litter and do laundry. That sounds familiar. <laughs> well, thank you. So nice to so nice to meet you. I mean, I know you, but our listeners, I'm sure that's what they're probably thinking as they're driving along. So, how about you, Jennifer? Who are you? Who is this Jennifer? Jenny. I am Jenny. I'm only Jennifer if I'm in trouble. Um, we have been married for 11 and a half years. That's crazy. Um, what I first noticed about you whenever we met is that your question? Sure. Why don't we just talk about this narcissism <laughs> fuel? Since I asked you, why don't you tell me a little bit more about me? <laughs> <laughs> no, just kidding. what was it? So, like we got married, but there was a moment in every marriage when you thought, "I want to marry you," and I know the moment when I thought, "I want to marry you." Okay, so we met at camp in summer of '09, and. Whenever we first met, I was like, this guy is so easy to hang out with. He's a really Aww. great friend and he's really funny, but he's so not my type. But <laughs> whenever we were off um, making dinner with some campers, I think the campers were around like, we'll say like six to nine years old. And I was over there working like the, the kitchen station. And these kids were just like, fussing and fighting with each other. And out of nowhere, Josh swoops in, sits down on the ground, crisscross applesauce with these little kiddos around him, like a little, mm. a little, like little herd of duckies is what it felt like. And he just kind of like rallied them together. And it was just this moment that I was like, I'm going to marry a dude like that someday. It was just like the, his, his way of interacting with kids and stuff. It was, it was, it was that moment that just kind of like, Something happened. I don't know. But I'd specifically told a fellow um, counselor at that camp, I will marry someone like that someday. And lo and behold, Ooh. it was you. I'm, I'm still refereeing fights. Smooth. This is true. Now it's just our children. That get... Smooth, Josh. Yeah. That was, um, would, I mean, was not, it was not by accident that Josh was like, oh, look at me and my my fathering skills next to this pretty co-counselor <laughs> that's the only reason i wanted to work with kids is just to pick up chicks you know just he also okay. famed a back injury since i was the camp nurse but that's a whole that's a whole nother story that's uh -huh. true um, lower about, lower is that what's the other piece of question yeah what, what else about you i <laughs> i didn't know if i finished your <laughs> questions um we have three kiddos. Tell me more about me. I am now <laughs> new to homeschooling. So I joined Stacy in the homeschooling mom thing. Um, and I also work part-time as a nurse. I've been a hospice nurse for four years, and that's been really amazing. Um, I love gardening. I also really enjoy baking. I love baking things. I don't like cooking dinner. I like baking things. Um, but yeah. She that makes a, a little something. super awesome carrot cake too. So next time you guys are mm. up, she'll have to make a carrot cake for you yeah. guys. It's amazing. So well, awesome. Well, thank you, ladies. Um, so Gabe and Stacey, you guys have been married 15 years. I'm sure there's probably been some seasons within those 15 years that have been really awesome and really great. And there's probably been seasons that have not been so great. Uh, do you want to open up and maybe share about a season that wasn't so great and what that was like? Or do you want yeah, us to go probably. first? <clears throat> no, it's okay. I'll, I'll go first. I would say, um, a season that wasn't so great was probably the first, uh, two or three years of our marriage. Um, I had a big, significant change in the path of my life through kind of like, I guess, a health crisis, you could say, I don't know. Um, and I had to kind of redefine what I wanted and figure out what it, who, who I was as a person. Um, all that I thought I was, was kind of wrapped up in being like a, a soldier. And I wanted to be 
a career army man. And uh, that changed suddenly and against my will. And so I had a kind of had a crisis, I guess, of identity. And because of that crisis, um, it took me to some places that, um, you know, I thought maybe maybe my future was like music or, um, you know, just I, I just I was unsure. So I was kind of just wandering through that. And because of that, I think I, I made a, a poor husband and subsequently a poor father. And uh, I didn't really, um, I guess I wasn't really putting God first in our marriage at that time. And um, we was just not making the best decisions with our money, with, with our time. Um, I wasn't being kind with my words to Stacey. And uh, yeah, I would say that our marriage was, was on a trajectory that it wasn't, wasn't going to be um, successful and sustainable over time. So um, I would say, and I could say with complete um, certainty that the past few years have been the best years of our marriage so far. Um, in that our friendship is the strongest it's ever been. And um, we know each other. We, we, know, we know each other as individuals, but we also we know each other what we dislike and what we like as, as, um, as friends. Um, so yeah, and I think, I think financially we're, we're in a better place than we have been. So that kind of take, takes a load off of our shoulders, you know, that stress off of our shoulders. So there's yeah, just a lot of factors that kind of intersect here 15 years in where we're like, okay, um, we, f now I'm not, I'm not saying that we're like, we let our guard down. I'm not saying that we get like complacent or anything like that, but you know, it's constant, like we're working and we're, we're maintaining our friendship and our marriage, um, which we're going to talk about yeah. some practices that uh, we have, but yeah, does that, does that answer your question? Absolutely. Absolutely. Stacy, what was that like for you in the midst of that tough season? Um, yeah, I was, as Gabe was talking about it, I was thinking how, uh, how clear things are in hindsight. Cause you know, at that time, I don't think we were aware that it was like a rough season, um, and that we were on a bad trajectory. I think we were, um, blissfully ignorant of, uh, of the road we were on, which was probably, um, towards divorce if, if nothing had changed. And yeah. I think it's, I think because we were young and just, you know, unaware of what a healthy marriage should look or feel like, I, I think we, um, yeah, I think we, we just didn't realize um, that we were doing it wrong. I guess um, sure. we never really looked at it in a in a purposeful way we we just you know you kind of figure hey we get along great like this will just come natural and um you you really we've we've gotten to counsel with a handful of couples um premarital counseling and not from a position of knowing all that much but just in a like kind of trying to instill a sense of purposefulness with them sure. in regards to marriage it's not just like hey you know this is gonna like you know jump in the water and you know you'll figure it out you'll you'll be able to doggy paddle your way through this it's like you know let's sit down talk about some of the stuff and and know that this is a, a learning curve and that this is something that you're going to need to put effort into and so yeah. um i think i think i i think i was I wasn't unhappy in those years. Like I said, I was just, I didn't know what a really fulfilling marriage felt like. So it felt gotcha. okay because it wasn't, you know, it wasn't horrible. It was, you know, we loved each other. We just were two kind of dumb kids. Um, felt kind of like aimless or something. Yeah, that's, that's probably yeah. a really good word to sum it up. Sure, 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 sure. Well, Jenny, uh, we've been married 11 years and we've been through some challenges. So <laughs> can you think of a season in our marriage when that maybe wasn't everything that we wanted it to be, or was kind of a, a tough stretch for us? I feel like 
the the time that really comes to my mind was what year would it have been after the church merger and we were building our home in Gracie with the baby so 2018 mm-hmm. we've been married about seven years at that time I guess yeah um I think of details of where to start. Um, we had like all the life transition happen all in the same time frame. Um, Josh had a change in position um, in his job. Um, he went from being executive pastor at one campus to now senior pastor after a church merger. Um, and we had a baby. We moved from our home in Murfreesboro um and we're living in woodbury we were looking for land and then we purchased our property and broke ground after gracie was like six weeks old um and after she was born i had a hard time picking up shifts and then i had a job change that was actually whenever i started with hospice and um so like all of those things that they kind of say take time in between yeah. transition or like these are going to be rough patches in the marriage all happen together. Um, it was really hard um, trying to understand each other. Try, just trying to, to read between the lines of like what was going on. And um, Josh was in a new position and he's trying to learn that. And I'm trying to learn a new job and, adding a new baby and making a really big decision about building. And um, it was a lot of stressors and just really, I feel like the best way of like saying what was going on in that season is I just felt like we were missing each other, mm -hmm. like just constantly missing each other. Um, whether it was like physically not actually being able to be in the same place at the same time, but just like not understanding each other. And um well, I think another, I mean, a huge stressor on top of all of that, um, you know, you mentioned we had a new baby, we had a two-year-old at the time, we had a new church, uh, and then building a house mm. was like <laughs> so much harder than we ever possibly thought it could be. And we had so many people that told us, oh, man, building a house is great. And then every now and again, somebody would pull us aside and go, hey, it's going to be terrible. <laughs> and and we'd be like, oh come on, you big party pooper, you know. But um, it was really, 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 really challenging on our marriage because we found out those differences in communication, those differences in personality. As Stacey, you were talking about earlier, like mm -hmm. um, how we made decisions, how we prioritized mm -hmm. certain things in making decisions. Um, yeah. And I think both of us kind of came to this place of like. I've got my way of seeing it that this is the right way to see it. And the other person was saying, I've got my way of seeing it. And this is the right way to see it. And um, honestly, I think that that one year kind of bled into the next year. And we kind of just swept everything under the rug when we moved into the house. Mm. Thought, it's going to be okay. And then I remember having a knockdown drag out fight a Saturday night in um, around Christmas time. Not not drag out as far as like it. Not <laughs> didn't we didn't punch, punch each other. Yeah, you no. Jenny, you didn't <laughs> like not. knock him down and drag him out of the house. It wasn't one of those. <laughs> she yeah broke my nose. Uh, that was on New Year's. <laughs> no. Yeah, that was on New Year's. Yeah. Well, here's the thing, and like you guys get this because you're in ministry. Like having a fight with your spouse is the worst. Having your fight with a spouse when you're a pastor is the worst. The night before you got to get up and preach the next morning. And the text yeah. that I was in was the text from Malachi that said, I hate divorce, says the Lord God of yeah. Israel. Like that was the text that God had me in. <laughs> and we're having like one of the worst fights we've ever had. And um, I just remember after I don't that. I remember that. I blocked it out of my memory. Oh, I remember. Uh, <laughs> but I remember like around that time, we kind of both looked at each other and we just said like, we need help. Like we're we're mm. stuck like we're stuck in really toxic negative communication patterns we're stuck in really um weird assumptions about each other and motives about each other and it seems like we kept getting into the same fight 
over and over and over and over again. And so every time mm-hmm. we would fight, it would really just be a, a pickup of the fight that we never really resolved, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. the last time we fought. And so, um, yeah, that was kind of the first time we'd ever had a, a crisis moment in our marriage. Um, and, uh, yeah, it was really painful to admit. It was really scary to say out loud, but it was actually one of the best things ever because we actually started getting help and getting healing from it. So. Yeah, so it makes you sense guys, what like, you were saying. Well, it would make sense what you were saying about how that that year of transition like it just kind of bled into the next year because you're so, well, it goes with what Jenny was saying about missing each other is you're so busy dealing with all those different transitions that if, if you maybe get a chance to talk about, Hey, um, I was frustrated about this or my expectations were unmet in this area. You know, if you have a chance to start that conversation, then the baby cries or someone's phone rings. Or you're just both so exhausted that you're like, you know, I've got to go to bed. I have to wake up early. And, and so in that first year that's going on. And then in the second year, when the transitions have sort of ironed out, you're still just in a busyness and it's like, you kind of just hope it'll, it'll air out and go away. And, um, Mm -hmm. that's, that's not, that's not typically how it works when there's um, like you said, kind of like a, uh, community communication, uh, patterns that are not ideal or personality differences that are, I mean, if that's, if it's literally a personality difference, that's not going to change unless you, you can, you know, when you recognize and know your, yourself and your spouse better then you can work around them. But typically personality isn't going to change. Yeah. Well, and I think we were both just really, really scared of having those tough conversations because it felt like we would, and then we would get to just an impasse. And it was like, I sit this way, you sit this way. Nothing's going to change. Like we've had the same fight for two years now. And so um, it was really scary, I think, to go there because it was kind of like, we know what the outcome of this is going to be and it feels familiar and, and um yeah, I think that uh, it took both of us being willing to go there and say what was really on our heart and mind. And then it took us both being willing to say, we can't keep ignoring this. We have to do something and we've got to be willing to do whatever it takes. Mm-hmm. Um, do, you, do you feel that way, Jenny, about that? Yeah, absolutely. To Ed. I don't know if that's where we are right now in our discussion, but just like understanding how to communicate with each other and how to listen. Um, I'm not the best with expressing myself verbally, like putting what I'm thinking and feeling into words has not been a strong suit for me. Josh is eloquent with his words. And sometimes I would feel frustrated because I just I I couldn't like, I couldn't put words together for what I was thinking and feeling and trying to express and just the misunderstandings that happened over and over again. Um, Because at the heart of it, what we were reminded of is like at the heart of it all, I love this person. Mm -hmm. This person is amazing. And like, I know that God put us together why, why do we just keep like missing each other time and time again? Why, why does this miscommunication keep happening time and time again? And I just felt really discouraged. And I feel like by the time like year two came around, because you just think like, okay, we're finally like in the new home. We're finally through that finish line. These things are going to be behind us. I felt like I felt discouraged. Like, trying to express something or trying to put words together Mm -hmm. I kind of felt defeated in in that on a personal level and like I don't even know like where to go from here um but I love you and I want to make this work I just can't I can't figure it out but yeah I don't know if that makes sense yeah it does yeah I've heard I've heard um 
someone in a um a tr- in a hard season of their marriage express um basically she said i'm so so worn out that i feel like our marriage would just end not in like a not in a a big bang sort of way but just like i'm just so tired i'm just so tired sure. of i'm just so worn out and um just fizzle out yeah just just exhaustion mm-hmm. from kind of going round and round and um you know hitting the same dead ends or roadblocks or you know i, I guess it would feel like driving around a roundabout endlessly and sure. um so for you guys to to say like to be really purposeful and say we've got to like we're going around this roundabout we've got to find the exit and that yeah. you know i think that's sadly a lot of people um maybe don't do that in time like they don't do that early on enough to where before they've wounded each other to a point of sure you know almost what you would call the point of no return although you know the, obviously um marriages can be saved sure at any point but you know what one would would call the point of no return yeah absolutely and i think like, you know i was like um uh, sorry i was gonna say real quick it sounds like um both of us as couples at some point in our marriage came to a came to a point where we're like we we recognize that something is off or unhealthy or there's a pattern that is going to going to prove itself unsustainable and then we we the four of us had to make a conscious decision let's fix what is broken let's make a conscious mm-hmm. effort yes. to fix this pattern and and break out of the cycle mm-hmm. and i think that's key um a lot of couples don't don't embrace it, they don't embrace the fact that something is off or broken and they just kind of blame it on the other spouse and say that it's mm-hmm. just them and I'm doing everything to the best of my ability, just them, mm-hmm. or it's just hurt that they've gone through in their life or trauma or something like that. And they don't ever break out of yeah. that cycle. Um, it's, it's a really tough thing to do, but what were you going to say? No, I was just going to say, my hope is for anybody listening to this podcast. Cause I, I know, and you, you guys probably speak to them as well. There's a lot of folks that are in a place of crisis in their marriage, but they don't want to admit it. Number one or they don't want anybody to find out number two. And so, Mm -hmm. um, and it's embarrassing, I think for some couples to admit like, Oh my gosh, we're having marital problems. Um, in some Christian communities, the the word divorce is like, that's the unpardonable sin. Mm -hmm. Right. And Mm -hmm. so there are some couples that I've counseled and met with and talked to that they're headed for divorce. And some of them are pretty much already there, but, um, to mitigate that means to be honest enough to say, Hey, this is probably where we're headed unless something changes. And that honesty and that naming it and that saying, we're going to get help. We're going to change it. That's the hardest part. But I think that's really step one for getting out of that pattern to getting out of that rocky season. So why don't we just, why don't we just uh, kind of go around round Robin style? I don't, I think I'm using that right. And uh, I think we could probably all agree that like admitting you need help is probably one of the ways to get out of a rocky season. But uh, mm-hmm. let's see who wants to maybe share an idea of how you get out of a rocky season, maybe from your own personal experience or talking with people. Yeah, I'll go first. Um, the first thing we wrote down is, you know, one of the ways in which we prevent ourselves from really facing our problems and getting ourselves out of a marital rut is keeping ourselves busy and busying our busying ourselves with um activities everything from our jobs to um kids school extracurricular activities church church activities and everything in between so time um gets taken from us and it takes time to resolve conflict and to identify patterns of behavior in conflict so um basically setting time apart and setting it aside for each other um, and making sure that uh, we are we are mitigating uh, too many distractions. And um, I know for Stacey and I, time is quality time is one of our love languages. So what we've done is um, we created a, a master calendar, first of all, that, um, you know, it's, it's a day timer. It's a physical day timer that is 
oftentimes sitting on our china cabinet and um we don't we don't uh schedule anything with for without first checking the master calendar to make sure there's no conflicts but also um you know we have a calendar meeting every week um that we sync our schedules that way um and then sometimes when push comes to shove if we feel like life's kind of caving in on us a little bit and we need some some downtime um like we just came off of a busy week celebrating the feast of tabernacles with our congregation um we're 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 um entering a calendar freeze time right now where neither of us mm. are going to put anything else on the calendar or accept any other any other invitations to anything for the next week or two just so we can kind of um decompress and spend time with a, as a family together and um yeah just kind of you know repair our friendship uh, you know if if any damage has been done which i don't think it has but just you know make sure we invest in each other as as a couple and as a friend as a friendship yeah, it, it's awesome. it's a it's kind of a a silly term, the calendar freeze, but um, we'll do that probably. I don't know. I would say every other month we'll be like, listen, this has been like I'm so worn out. Like for the next week, it's a calendar freeze. If anyone asks about like, you know, it's just we're on a calendar freeze. So unless there's an emergency, um. You know, and well, so we would say we would say that to someone like if they said, "Oh, hey, like you know, let's do this on on Sunday," and it's like, "Listen, we're on a calendar freeze." So yeah, and you guys know, as pastor and wife, you get invited to all manner of things, and people want you to come to yeah. their house, or they want you to go out to eat with them, or whatever, and that's wonderful. And people are so friendly and hospitable, but um, you can be pulled in a million different directions if you don't make yourself stop and say, well, today is just going to be set aside for our family, you know? Yeah, so. absolutely. That's good. That's really good. So who wants to go next? That's a good one. Making time. That's super important. Yeah. I think it's your turn in, in the round robin, right? Is it my turn? So. Oh, gosh. Well, I think, oh, are we, are you oh. talking about like between the four of us, we would rotate? I figured I we I'm would, talking about, I thought like, round robin um, was like, we'd bounce back and forth, like kind of like ping pong, you know? <laughs> I don't know what round robin is. I'm just- To be honest, I don't, I don't know what round robin is either. I just, I heard that one time and I thought it sounded intelligent, so I used it. Um, all right, I'll go next. Uh, okay, so my number one, if you're in a rocky place and you know you need to get out of it is humble yourself. Mm. And the reason I wrote that is because I think where I- was doing wrong for so long as I got so exceptionally self-righteous and kind of felt like if my wife would just get it, then our marriage would get fixed. Like, <laughs> and kind of had this like righteous indignation. Mm -hmm. And what it really was is I think that Satan was kind of just feeding those mm -hmm. lies, and taking me down that path of just, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. making me more bitter and making me more hard-hearted towards my wife instead of seeing the whole picture of really you know for any marriage if there's issues there's two parties involved it's not all your spouse um and so like having to get humble having to get unguarded having to stop being uh defensive and really to walk towards the mess and initiate that reconciliation um I think that in those really painful seasons, something that we did that was a terrible habit, I don't think any marriage should ever do, is like the whole stonewalling and silent treatment thing was a really negative, toxic conflict pattern that we had where I would just get really upset about something and I would just be like, I'm not talking to her until she apologizes mm. and go for a long, 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 long time. It was kind of this emotional sage of just like, I'm just starve her out. I just won't talk to her. Sometimes mm. I didn't even know that something was wrong because we weren't communicating. So I was blissfully unaware, thinking we were peachy all, all the while. He's feeding. And in my mind, I'm going, well, oh. if she doesn't know what's wrong, then I mean, I'm not going to tell her because that means she doesn't care. That means mm -hmm. she's not aware of me. That means she doesn't really care about me. She doesn't love me. And she's not really committed to mm -hmm. marriage. I mean, all this crazy script I was feeding myself. And so for our marriage to actually um, start to heal, I had to acknowledge the self-righteousness in my own heart and say, 
No, I'm the one to blame for a lot of this. And this is a very, very, very unhealthy and toxic conflict pattern that I've got to, I've got to figure out. Um, fun fact, not only am I the introvert of the two, I also am the most feminine when it comes to communication of the two. So in almost every mm. marriage study we've done, a couple we counsel, mm -hmm. I can like connect with the ladies and be like, oh, I do that. I do that. And like all the guys are like, what? It's crazy. And Jenny's like, yeah, I'm just like the guy. So mm. um, yeah. I don't know what that is about me, but I have a very feminine, feminine minded uh, communication style. So there you go. Fun it's it's interesting. It, it's just different people. No, I think like that's like, I appreciate you acknowledging that because in, in almost, I wouldn't say almost every couple, but in most couples, um, there is that dynamic where if you've got, um, a woman who's more, I don't want to say assertive or, or I don't want to say masculine. I don't necessarily want to pin it to gender, but, um, sure. I guess it is, it's easiest for us to pin it to gender. Sometimes if you've got, um, uh, like my parents have more like the dynamic you're describing that you guys have where my dad's uh, more sensitive and my mom's more just, you know, say it like it is and not really apt to get her feelings hurt. Um, and I think, I think it's, uh, super like healthy to acknowledge that. And it's neat that you're able to bring that to the table and then give the guys like, Hey, let me explain how it feels, you know, on her, <laughs> on her side. <laughs> There's a reason for it all. It's okay. Yeah. One what of the that, things that if I we could piggyback off of that, that. I'm sorry, Gabe. If we could piggyback that? off of that, oh, you're good. Um, you know, we we also have one of our habits um, that we have written down is is really similar to that, and that is mm -hmm. choosing healthy conflict over Cold War style mm -hmm. passive aggressiveness. And so mm -hmm. many times, people think that if you have conflict, that's bad, but conflict in a healthy way is actually really good and healthy. It's actually um, what propels you to the next level of your friendship and marriage. So it's like being mm -hmm. honest um, to each other uh, outside of moments of, of intense e emotion, but being honest about the things that bother us. Um, and then it prevents negative emotions from building up and festering over time. But you have to do that Absolutely. outside of outside of a fight, outside of an argument, outside mm -hmm. of intense emotions, and just say, hey, just so you know, you know, when you do this, it makes me feel this way. Um, or when you talk to me that way, mm -hmm. I, I feel dumb or stupid or belittled. And, um, you know, so it, it's important that you, you choose healthy conflict and, and work through with that conflict. Um, otherwise, yeah, you have this backlog of, of injuries and offenses that you've dealt each other. Absolutely. That's so good. One of the things I had written down was listening um really listening to the other person and understanding their perspective and why they feel the way that they feel um understanding that you don't you don't know what they are thinking and feeling and the reason why they did what they did unless you ask them um and i felt like something that that we were not doing well in those couple of years that were really tough is assuming what the other person's mm -hmm. intentions were whether it was why they made a decision the way that they did or spoke the way that they did, um, um, taking it personally rather than just saying, hey, are you okay? Is there anything going on? And just really, really getting to the heart of it because what we found underneath it all was that things really weren't the way that we thought that they were. Um I'm trying to think of an example. Can you think of an example with that? <clears throat> I felt like that was one of our biggest breakthroughs yeah. was really understanding how to listen. So I think like when it came to making decisions about the house, like that, that was an area of conflict. Um, we both wanted the same thing, but we would make assumptions. And the assumption I made with Jenny is that 
she was nitpicky and she cared way too much about details and it was super impractical and you know we were never going to get this house done it was going to take us 10 years and that was just how she's wired she's why she's a nurse like if she doesn't know details she's going to kill people mm-hmm. like she knows details she's really good at it and i just instead of me recognizing her strength i just assumed that was her just mm-hmm. being a diva and a princess um I, on the other hand, I'm a big picture guy. I'm used to managing people. I'm used to managing teams. Mm -hmm. And so when I look at this big house building project, I'm like, man, we got to get this house built. We got to get it built sometime within a year. I'm like, let's keep the ball rolling. Let's Mm -hmm. go fast on it. And I think Jenny sometimes would assume that that was me just kind of half a in it. And uh, can I say it on the podcast? I can say it on the podcast. Yeah. We'd say whatever. You just did. Uh, I just did. Yeah. And so, yeah, just kind of going like, wait a second, we want the same thing. We want the house mm-hmm. to be built and we want it to be built well and we want it to be built in a timely ma- manner. Why don't we stop assuming that the other person is doing it wrong mm-hmm. and recognize mm-hmm. each other's strengths mm-hmm. and honor and respect each other because those are differences that we both need and hear each other out mm-hmm. instead of just getting frustrated with each other mm-hmm. and flying off the handle. Like I would assume that he just didn't care or was very flippant. And just like, yeah, they're all gray. Like, just pick that one. And I'm like, no, but there's different undertones. And so I also, (laughs) like in a practical way, I came to understand there were questions that I should go to him about and like get his opinion on because it's his home. And then other things that maybe I should just talk to somebody else about in detail that could meet Mm -hmm. me there. And then once I Mm -hmm. kind of hash out some of those thoughts, Bring it to him and be like, hey, uh, do you like option A or B? Not option one through yeah. two. Because it's like, why in the world would anyone create 10 different shades of pink? This is stupid. Just pick that one. And and I'm like, no, but you're just not listening to me. And so it understanding that like I had to meet him where he was and he needed to meet me where I was. And paint color is such a silly thing just to to, to talk about because there's a lot more deeper things that go on. But um, that was something that was oh, like no. a real life. <laughs> how to how yeah, to deal we've, with we've something. had we've had big fights over paint color. We've had big <laughs> fight, and I'm 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 with you on paint color. I will. I mean, it's funny you said gray because we probably had ten oh, or more samples of gray. And it was causing marital strife. <laughs> and I was like, yeah. this is a big commitment. We're only gonna we're only gonna paint the exterior of our house probably one time while we live here. We need mm-hmm. to choose the right gray because it could look real real lame if this we did very it. Intimidating and Gabe was like, decision. No, it'll look I... fine. Yeah. Yeah. See, my my like, thing is like an, people another... and they... The neighbors are going to be like they're lame. They painted their house gray, so it's like it doesn't matter what shade of twelve shade we pick out. It's like it's you know it's a lose lose. So you might as well just yeah pick one and just go with it. So you wanted a bright blue house. That's what you. Yeah. Um, I was going to say, and besides like paint color and like making decisions, um, a real life example and like listening to each other and like understanding where someone is. Um, This actually happened two weeks ago, two weeks ago. Yeah. Um, I've had a lot of trouble with migraines lately and um, I was at work just trying to get through the day. It was a really, really rough day physically at work. And I had to call Josh and get something figured out with our schedule. And it's something that had to be made like right then I needed to talk to my husband about it. And I was really short like very quiet, like Mm. monotone. Like I, I just Mm. was like hardly functioning. And his response was like kind of the tone of like, why are you mad at me? What have I done? And I immediately had to say, it's not you. I don't feel good. Mm -hmm. Please don't take this personally. I just have to figure out what's going on with the situation and how to get it done. I don't feel good. Like it's me. It's not Mm -hmm. you. And understanding from that point he could be able to meet me where I was a lot better rather than just assuming like I was just being mean and ugly 
in that moment. And that really wasn't it at all. Like I really was having a super tough day um, and understanding how to meet each other in those ways. Um, I feel like we've, we've improved on and, and it's made a really big difference in our relationship. Yeah. That's Sorry, a good example. Sure. Yeah. So what was, uh, what was your guys next one? I've heard from Gabe, heard from Jenny, heard from me. Um, what about you? Um, I guess we're going to go with date nights, which is something that we, um, so I said we'd been married for 15 years and we've really only been doing this for the past two years. And it was something Gabe pushed really hard um, for us to do, or is it three years? Anyway, um, I was really like, um, I hated to um pay for a pay for a babysitter and then pay for um a date and i was like that's you know that's not practical to do that every week and um but gabe was really insistent on it and so um so we started doing it and i'm i'm glad we did it's um it's it's worth the effort and you don't have to you don't actually have to spend a lot of money so something we've done is sometimes you'll you can swap date nights with another couple where one week all we'll watch your kids and the next week you'd watch ours and then obviously you don't have to you don't have to go out to a, a restaurant and a movie you could do one or the other or you can just um you know sometimes our dates are like going to lowe's because we need to pick out paint color <laughs> um, not, not but you know like home supplies and just just getting out of the house without the kids um yeah just making out in the lowe's parking lot mm, yeah <laughs> so it's, um something that keeps us from talking about our kids the whole time we're gone is um sometimes we'll do double dates and that's um i don't know it's it's fun if you if you yeah. have good friends, because then you kind of tease and talk about stuff other than just like, hey, what do we need to like, instead of it being like a business meeting of catching up on business sure. because your kids aren't there or talking about your kids. So um, double dates are something we do probably once a month. But yeah, so we have mm -hmm. we have a specific night of the week. Um, for us, it's Thursdays. That is our date night. And sometimes stuff comes up on the calendar that, you know, that it won't happen every week, but it's more often than not. And, um, but you'd be surprised when you're consistent in that and you just keep it Thursday night, you'd be surprised at how many people, um, respect that mm -hmm. and, and leave yeah. you alone in that time too. knowing that your date night is a Thursday night. They don't blow up your phone or they don't invite you to this or put this on you. Um, so. Yeah, it was funny. Uh, we used to hire, uh, she was like 16 or 17 at the time. Her name was Macy. And uh, she's kind of a funny, kind of spunky girl. And we would hire her to babysit the boys. And uh, we would we'd be like, okay, hey, we're going to be home by nine. And we'd pull up to the in the driveway at like 845 or something. And um, so I would text her, you know, I'd pull up in the driveway and park. And I'd text her, be like, hey, Macy, um, Stacey and I are about 15 minutes early. So we're just going to sit out here in the car and make out for 15 minutes. We'll, we'll come in at nine. <laughs> and I was like... I would just, I would just wait for her response. And like, I could see like, so many times she would be like sitting on the couch in the living room and I could see her through the door and like watch her get the text and like just watch her reaction. And the other thing, the other thing I would do, oh, bless, bless her heart. She was such a saint. I would walk in after three hours of babysitting our boys, which is, oh gosh, I, I would walk in and, uh, I'd be like, Hey, thank you so much. And I'd like dig around in my pocket and I'd pull out like a dollar and like 35 cents and like hand it to her. <laughs> And be like, thank you so much. Like, like we'll see you next Thursday or whatever, and keep like a perfectly straight face, and just like see her reaction is is priceless. Oh, so she, she, she she'd had kind of that look on her face. Like, I don't know if you read Calvin and Hobbes, uh, the babysitter yeah, Rosalind yeah, yeah. would just like give them a cold, dead stare and say, "It's going to need to be more tonight." Yeah. <laughs> that's awesome. That's hilarious. Oh man, that's good too. Date nights. But yeah, date Always date night. Fun. Date night tonight. It's good. That was a Justin Timberlake thing, but anyway. Um, I, 
think one of the things that we found when we were in a really, really tough spot is we had to get over our fear and our stigma of marriage counseling because there was no way forward for us. We kept doing the same things over and over and over again, having the same fights over and over again. And we were terrified of getting help because of the stigma associated with it. We weren't, I was. Yeah, especially, I as, was. especially as a pastor and his wife. I mean, even, yep. even more so for sure. Absolutely. And I'm a child of divorce. And I think when I thought of like, getting marriage counseling, I just thought, I mean, this is just like, you know, step one to the long road that leads to divorce. Um, but I think there's like this huge misunderstanding about it. Um, I think the fear that I had was that one of us was going to use a marriage counselor as a weapon. Like I was going to try mm. subconsciously to figure out how to manipulate this counselor to make them take my side so they could gang up on Jenny. And I guess there was a fear that, um, that there were some things that I was doing and I didn't really want a counselor to point that out because I had had this kind of self-righteous script in my mind that it was all her. Um, but I think the thing that we found is that like we both had significant blind spots that Jenny had been telling me for years and I wasn't hearing her. And I had been telling Jenny for years and she wasn't hearing me, but when a third party got involved and said the exact same thing, for whatever reason we heard, mm. because it kind of rose above the static and the white noise of all this like emotionally tense conflict to have a neutral third party kind of look at a situation and go, Hey, these are really negative toxic communication patterns. And, and Josh, you really need to stop doing that. And of course, Jenny had told me that for years, but to have a counselor look at me and say that it was like, Okay. And then I felt like super embarrassed that I hadn't listened to my wife all the other times when she told me that. Um, mm. But that really helped us. That really helped us just be intentional about it. And they weren't always fun. They were hard, but very, 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 very productive and really helped us kind of get to a spot where we could turn back the emotional intensity for a little bit and just see clearly and go, wow, I'm, I'm sorry. I did some stuff really, really wrong. I've not been the man I needed to be. And, uh, we praise God for that. Our, our counselor's name is John. Great guy. Um, really helped us out quite a bit. Did you get a, did you get a recommendation or were you, um, just fortunate that you, you know, found a counselor that was really great and worked for you, um, you know, right off the bat? Well, so we have a, uh, um, within our church, a connection with a ministry called Standing Stone that does counseling services for pastors and their wives, and it's free. And it's a ministry that they offer, um, and it's a national thing. And so we had some folks in our church that had gone to see John. And, um, you know, I had been honest with some folks that I work with and just kind of said, Hey, we're really struggling. And they said, Hey, why don't you go see John? Like it's, you know, it's a ministry that is offered to pastors uh, with no financial burden to them. And um, so we were, you know, we, we were fortunate enough. We had that. Um, but you know, what's cool though is like, there's good godly Christian counselors all across the U S and um, you know, if somebody's in a place of, feeling intimidated, like, where do I start? You know, we can, mm -hmm. somebody can send us an email and we'll get them resources to connect. I think once you, you're able to mm -hmm. find those resources, it makes it a lot easier. So. Well, you had met with John for a little while before I came along and now I know why, because you had to test the waters. No, I was <laughs> testing the waters. Yeah. So if he's trustworthy <laughs> to bring my wife along. Yeah. <laughs> No, he, he got to meet with John for a little while and then um, John had recommended that we got to meet together and it was, it was just a really good time. And I honestly feel like the best time of like, of counseling was the hour long drive there and back together. Like I mm -hmm. love our time in the car. Like that's the best part of date night is just being mm -hmm. able to be alone without the kids mm -hmm. and just talk and 
it it's my favorite time. So. Oh. Aww. Aww, we we're in love. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Um, <laughs> you guys are making out of the most parking lot, not us. So I know. Uh, so in their parking lot while they're oh yeah, yeah, in your driveway with the babysitter. Yeah, yeah, yeah both of them. Underneath the couch. So. Hey, so for the sake of time, um, we got five minutes left. So what what would you say? Like, what's just like one parting word? If there is a person listening to this, and man, their marriage is in the dumps. They're hopeless. They are tired. They feel like they just don't know where to go. Like, what piece of advice would you give them? And this can be for anybody. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, seek help. Uh, seek a Bible believing, Bible teaching community with a shepherd who exemplifies the fruit of the Spirit, and um, mm-hmm. and and see what resources they have available to you to to, to find help. And um, it could just be in the form of making friends with people who have healthier marriages or have been at it longer than you have, or it could be getting counseling from someone at the church. But um, Mm -hmm. yeah, being, being um, plugged into something like that is, is pivotal and very important um, in, in, in writing the ship for sure. Absolutely. Somebody else? Um, The thing that came to mind while you were asking that question was, um, and you said it earlier, was just being humble, um, but being willing to apologize for anything that's happened up to that point and having an open heart to, to really be able just to hear the other person, um, and share and share your heart, um, without any preconceived ideas. Um, I think within that two, I'll get, I'll give two things, but having another person to be able to talk to, whether it's another couple that y'all feel connected to, to be able to talk together, um, a pastor or a mentor, like, um, a female mentor, um, having another guy in his life. Um, just to be able to speak a lot of words of wisdom and encouragement, um, knowing that they are your cheerleaders in your marriage and they, they want you to succeed. Um, Mm -hmm. having that voice of encouragement from other people who have been there too, um, I think is huge. Um, knowing that you're not alone. Absolutely. Stacey, what would you say? Um, I'm kind of picking up piggybacking off of what Jenny said, uh, with, um, vulnerability, I would say is, is something that when you get, when you get down the road in your, in a tough spot in your marriage, it's, it's kind of like the battle lines have been drawn and, and I've pulled back, um, because you've hurt me and I've pulled back and you know, I, I have limited trust with you and that can be a vicious cycle, which I think we, you know, we kind of touched on earlier and, um, vulnerability is, is something that humans thirst for, um, and something we, we deeply need in our closest relationships. And when it, it, like I said, it's a vicious cycle as a marriage, um, is hurting that you pull away in that area. And I would say, start with your partner by being honest and vulnerable and saying, um, these are my hurts. These are my fears. Um, and you know, I'm, I'm scared we're on a path to divorce and it hurts me when you do this and, um, ultimately vulnerability fosters intimacy and um between when there's two healthy adults who both want to be in that relationship vulnerability will foster intimacy and that will start to break uh, an unhealthy cycle that will that will put you on a path um towards healing ideally you're bringing in resources but um just saying 
like, I love you so much and I'm scared this is falling apart. You know, just that's, that can be the kind of something that starts to turn the tide, but ideally pulling in resources to help. Absolutely. Yeah. I would just say, um, if somebody's in that place, first of all, like, don't believe the lie that, um, don't believe the lie that you can't be honest or you can't be open and that people are going to look down on you for reaching out and getting help. Mm -hmm. I think shame is such a powerful thing that keeps people from really pursuing the help that they need and pursuing the vulnerability, Stacey, that you talked about and um, a good pastor and biblical community gave you talked about and a good friend that Jenny, you talked about. So really I'm not saying anything new. I'm just saying all the things that you guys said were really good. So I'll just say that like, <laughs> Pursue all that they said, but at the same time, don't let shame keep you from doing that because I think that's what keeps mm -hmm. people from really getting help. And that's what keeps people from getting out of these tough mm -hmm. seasons is because they just feel so ashamed to admit it to themselves or admit to other people. So um, believe the gospel. You're loved and accepted and um, because of Jesus and uh, he's able to forgive and restore and redeem. And mm -hmm. um, yeah, it can be done. So that's all I got to say about that. <laughs> <laughs> um, while you were talking, I thought of something else. Um, as far as like the really serious conversations that obviously happen whenever there's conflict and stuff happening, sometimes that can just feel really, really heavy. I would encourage with the date nights, being able to, to like leave that stuff aside for a minute and be able just to go and have a lot of fun, experience Absolutely. something new together, um, and, mm -hmm. and, and if you're dating again, and um, ex experiencing new things together, and just kind of breathe life into the relationship, because the, the heavy conversations over and over and over again, sometimes it gets, it gets so heavy. Um, yeah. But, um, we learned to go, yeah, I learned to go to play. And so that was a fun thing that we just kind of went and, and, and did together. We went and played top golf for the first time. And it was fun things like that. I yeah. don't know. That was something that came to me. Yeah. Going to escape rooms. I like that. That's a good point. That's a good point to, to be really purposeful about having a positive interaction in the midst of like the hard stuff and the heaviness to be like, listen, we're going to have fun. You know, we're going to, we're going to watch a stupid funny movie and we're going to laugh or we're going to Amen. go Amen. be silly and play golf or there's these, these new places now ax throwing. I'm like, yeah, really? we've done that. But I mean, I imagine it's fun. It was so fun. Neither one of us had done it before. So it was super fun. Yeah. The novelty wears off pretty quickly. You kind of feel like you're just doing the same thing over and over again. And they're like, isn't this cool? And you're like, well, it was for the first 10 minutes. But uh, after that, kind of. But it really was fun. It was, yeah. Well, ladies, thank you guys for being a part of our mm -hmm. our little, little podcast. Yeah, Non-bearded non podcast. Yeah. You're welcome. Oh, wait, <laughs> never mind. All right. Uh, Gabe is so uh, delirious with his cold. He's, he's barely lucid right now. Yeah. So. Look, my roll of toilet paper is like 25% smaller now since what <laughs> Oh, you want to see my pile of uh, snot rags over here? Uh, see not really. Accumulated just yeah. I mean, are you about to show me whether or not I want to see it? Uh, well, he did. That's true. <laughs> oh man, that's that is substantial. That is a plentiful abundance. Yes. Wow. They do. My goodness. Yeah. I want to get some Clorox wipes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Wipe that away. So, anyway. Well, thank you guys for listening. Thank you guys for watching. If you have any questions at all, or you have any comments, or if you are in a place where you need help and you don't know where to turn, send us an email, send us a Facebook message, appeared the Bible Podcast at gmail.com. We would love to pray with you, talk with you, maybe help point you in the right direction. And uh, yeah, thank you guys for listening. See you guys.